Welcome everyone to the uh, March 2, 2017 Ordinance Committee for the Town of Scarborough. Uh, with me today, uh, on my left, Kate St. Clair, on my right, Will Rowan, and this is the Three Person Ordinance Committee. Uh, first order of business, approval of minutes. So moved. I was seconded. I was not present, however. Okay, I'll second it. Uh, Thank you, sir. Any corrections? I did not see any. I did not either. All in favor? Good. Uh, the way I would like to be able to, uh, we've got three important issues on the agenda, but I don't want to hold people up. Uh, uh, if you would like to, we'll have a public session in advance of each one. So uh, uh, anyone wishing to address us on the first item on the agenda, which is consumer fireworks, please feel free to uh, join us. I know that we have some phantom fireworks representatives in the audience. They, uh, uh, Jeff was uh, previously, uh, and if, uh, the other gentleman who I just met would like to introduce himself, uh, that would be great. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Dan Peart, uh, Director of Government Affairs with Phantom Fireworks. Um, thank you for having the meeting today in an open forum like this. I'm interested to see what the committee has uh, put forth as far as an ordinance proposal. Um, but thank you for the consideration given to our company, Phantom Fireworks, throughout this process. You guys have been very fair with us, and, and we do appreciate that. Yeah, and I, I think we've, we've appreciated uh, uh, I think some of the language in the uh, 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 respect respect your neighbor uh, 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 policy that we we have before us today as a part of the permitting uh, comes pretty much verbatim <laughs> from some of your own literature as to good advice uh, to citizens as to how to use fireworks. So uh, if we have questions as we go along, we'll we'll certainly uh, ask you to. Uh, Give us your, your best advice. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, let's take a look at the fireworks ordinance. Uh, at our last meeting, mm -hmm. uh, we decided that um, eliminating the 5th of July mm -hmm. and ending uh, all fireworks on the four days that remained at 10 p.m. would be appropriate. And yeah. I think you've all seen the draft. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that, that I think, looks in order. There was one thing that I saw, Mr. Chair, and I, of course, probably did not write it down. It's going to drive me crazy. So I'm not, I don't think it was anything big, and I think if it's an issue, I could probably catch it at the, okay, at the council level. While you're, while you're checking that, uh, I wanted to advise everybody that uh, neither the uh, chief of police or the fire chief could make it today, and we want them to be able to weigh in on the permit process. Okay. The permit process is obviously new. It's, uh, oh, it's, I know it it's a major element of what we're trying to do. We respect the fact that enforcement of fireworks violations is difficult as a consequence going towards an education program uh, uh, is probably our best bet to achieve some greater uh, satisfaction amongst those people who are uh, uh, have complained to us about fireworks. So uh, we'll uh, let the details of the um, actual permit process go, but I think we can still deal with uh, the other aspects, uh, and let's let's start with the um, uh, 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 permit application. Right. Uh, is, uh, that looks fine to me. Um, I don't have a, any issue with the with with what you drew up. I don't have a copy of it right here, but I looked at it online. Um, my only issue, do you want me to tell you the yeah, one thing ahead. that yeah. um, was under um, violation and enforcement? Um, 
just somewhere in the language, I was hoping, just so that it's clear to anyone who looks at it, that um, a copy each day, or a copy the days that um, permits are issued, a copy will be given to dispatch. Mm -hmm. So that when people call in and make complaints, dispatch has a copy of who has received a permit. So we know that if, dispatch will know that if 41 Woodfield Drive has a permit and they're in the um, ordinance in those times, there's no reason to send an officer to that location. We can explain to the person calling in, no, sorry, that's, a, you know, they're within the permit, and here's the details. Does that make sense? Yes. No. Um, I just want to make sure that a copy goes to dispatch. And Tom, would you say that's sort of a process? Yeah, we have all sorts of uh, protocols in place now. An issue that we can deal with outside the scope of the ordinance itself, or should it be? Yeah, that's an administrative detail that I don't think needs to be. I think it's a good here. suggestion. Yeah, sure, and, and we have all sorts of protocols already in place for okay. dispatch to be aware of things on a real-time basis. How would you feel about the, that? I'm, I'm fine with not including it and having it be a protocol. Sure. And, it, and it may be dispatched that issues the permit. That's one of the pieces yeah. that I'd like you to receive some input from the, both the police and fire chief. Good. Yeah. But I think that's pros and cons of different ways of doing that. So they may be in possession of that because they issued a permit. Right. Who issues to the fire department? They issue the burn permits, right? They do. Okay. But the volumes are much less. They're probably in the order of busy day, 10 a day. Yeah. And I think there's some concern about. Um, High volume just yeah, around yeah. these allowed dates. Yeah. Uh, Are so those burn permits issued out of every station? I believe so, yes. Uh, Eight or ten a day total? Mike says on a high day it's probably ten that are issued. So we've got four or five stations? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think they're all created equal either, mind you. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Chief Thurlow will certainly be able to. Are they, in that regard. Yeah, are they planning on being at our next meeting? Yes, they are. Unfortunately, they're, they're both on vacation together. Is oh. They're not here. So, uh, <laughs> Good for them. I think it's a great thing that a police chief and fire chief Me too. Like, yeah. like each other so much they go on vacation together. <laughs> That's too, nice. so. There you go. Uh, yeah, you don't go on vacation with me. That's weird. <laughs> the, uh, the <laughs> for, for people, uh, you know, we are, uh, as everyone knows, we are broadcasting live across the nation <laughs> uh, on this, and maybe even RTTV mm -hmm. picking this up. Uh, but uh, the uh, permit application is going to ask people to uh, uh, sign an acknowledgement that they uh, agree to the permit terms, and uh, that if it's not their property, it's, they have the permission of the property owner, that they have liability insurance for both bodily injury and property damage uh, uh, from the use of the fireworks, uh, and that they've read the Respect Your Neighbor guidelines that are attached to and made a part of the fireworks permit and agree to follow the terms. And the uh, 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 guidelines go on to say uh, you'll uh, follow good safety practices as, as the retailer sets out, that you're not going to uh, set off uh, fireworks if it's going to be uh, unreasonably uh, disruptive of your neighbor, uh, uh, that you're going to advise your neighbor, uh, neighbors, uh, uh, when and where you're going to set them off so that they're apprised of that, have the opportunity to voice any concerns that they may have. Uh, so those are the, uh, the basic, and that you're not going to uh, set off fireworks that's going to be unfairly or unreasonably disru disruptive of uh, pets uh, or uh, uh, farm animals uh, that you may have. So uh, what we're trying to do with the respect your neighbor policy that becomes part of the permit that you are acknowledging you'll go by is use good practices at all times. Uh, that's really what uh, what the intention is. So, can I say something real quick? Go right ahead. And I think that um, you know we've been working on this for a couple of years, and I I think that this is we've gotten to finally a point where this is a compromise between the people that are really upset about this and the people that this is a long-standing tradition for them to continue to use fireworks. And you know I'm at a place now where I'm just so frustrated by this process that I hope that this works. And if it doesn't, 
you know, within the next few years, you know, I would hope that it was taken to a level where, you know, we may have to start asking people in town, the fireworks people, that they have to show their permit before they can buy them. Yeah. If we can't keep this under control and if people don't start abiding by the practices that we set forward. I know that's kind of, you know, a stretch, but I feel like that's better than, you know, we have some people that want them gone altogether. That's true. That mm -hmm. want them banned completely. So um, I'm hoping that people are going to take this as, okay, we've got to follow these rules because we don't want them to take them away altogether. And that's um, really where it'll head. Yeah. Uh, if if I agree. we cannot reduce the number of uh, objections and expressions of concern, I had another lady call me, an uh, uh, older woman, uh, who said it just, it's very, very disruptive mm -hmm. to her. Uh, call me this morning. So, mm -hmm. uh, Will, any thoughts on uh, uh, the. Uh, Permit application and the so I, I really like the permit application from the aspect of putting that causing the uh, applicant to read and sign and or at least acknowledge that they've read the respect your neighbor guidelines I think that's fantastic and I also appreciate uh, Phantom Fireworks for passing that out um, uh, but I'm also hopeful that uh, expanding the the uh, I know that enforcement is a challenge here but I'm also hopeful that including the property owner is going to um, um, hopefully improve compliance but uh, yeah we have we have one of the other amendments is that uh, if a violation occurs uh, on a particular property that the property owner assumes responsibility for that and so the ticketing uh, does not have to be necessarily limited to the individual right. but also to the property owner and so this is an effort to have property owners exercise greater responsibility over the process. Yep. I think I am also a little bit concerned that we have um, uh, an education, we're going to have an education problem from the get-go uh, about people that aren't aware that we now have a, a permitting for people that come from out of town that don't, don't buy here in town. Um, but I think that's something that communications can take up also and we can work on getting, making sure that we get it out into the public before the major holidays. I know we were just talking that Memorial Day is big for them, and that's when they kind of start their season. So we'll, we, that's probably something that we could get on mm -hmm. and try to make sure that we have it posted everywhere. Yeah, and I'm just thinking summer visitors as well. We yep. get a lot of yep. yeah, uh, uh, residents. Uh, Council St. Clair heads the communications uh, committee for the town, and that that's probably a good springtime initiative to, uh, to get the word out. Uh, since uh, this will be hopefully passed to the town council uh, rather rapidly. Uh, the last change that I want to bring to everybody's attention uh, that is new uh, is a notice provision which requires any authorized retailer for the sale of consumer fireworks in the town of Scarborough shall provide written notice at the time of sale to all purchasers of consumer fireworks at their Scarborough retail stores that a permit is required for use in the town of Scarborough at set forth in section Roman numeral four above. And so right. again, when, when I, I came to think about this, uh, how do you get people to realize that there's a permit process? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, when I looked at the materials that Phantom provided us, they actually had the hours and days that it was legal in the town of Scarborough to do. So they were already 90% of the way there. So it seemed to me that uh, if this retailer was able to quite easily provide that information to consumers who might use those fireworks in Scarborough, adding something related to the obligation to get a permit uh, didn't seem like a stretch. Uh, and, and as I observed, that, that uh, material, those materials were being given to every single person, consumer who was in the store. So, uh, any problems with that? Not for me. Nope. Good. All right. Uh, so, uh, I think. Uh, Are we tabling this so that we have. We to will. Uh, I'll accept the motion to table to the next meeting. B before we do that, actually, I did have one more comment. So, uh, Tom, I thought I heard you say that there was some concern over actually the submission of the, the permits. That we were concerned about the volume and, and how the mechanics of how we're going to. 
Can we do I that? think there's okay. some options. We can either decentralize it and have them available at each of the fire stations, which is probably more convenient for residents because yep. we have them kind of distributed around town. Uh, the problem is we don't have, we, we may need to provide adequate staffing on those day, the day before, the day of. I suspect there'll be a last minute rush. Not many mm -hmm. folks will plan ahead and get permits days, much less weeks mm -hmm. ahead of the event. I, much of it is spontaneous, I suspect. Uh, so that's not, not insurmountable. That's something we need to talk about. The other option is to use dispatch. Uh, the value of that is we have personnel dedicated on site 24-7. Right. Uh, but you know, they are taking calls and someone might have to wait a bit. Uh, so we don't, we may not have dedicated staff to, the customer service may lack depending on when they come and what else is going on in dispatch. Um, so there's options and the chiefs will kind of walk, walk you through those options. Would you ask the chiefs so that they'll come prepared to, to uh, respond to this, whether both uh, mm -hmm. is available. Right. The more we can disperse okay. the burden, mm -hmm. the better. Mm -hmm. uh, and dispatch is convenient because it's more uh, consumer friendly. I agree. It's got a waiting area, uh, there's a person there 24-7, so that, uh, that, but yet it's only one point of contact. So sure. I'll have them prepared okay. for that. Good. Just, yep. I could, the thing I could just observe, in terms of enforcement, I just want to be clear about the expectations. Uh, we've done, we've, we've analyzed the complaints that we've received since 2012, since this was first allowed. Uh, just appreciate over 70% 70, 70 of the complaints come from periods of time outside of mm -hmm. what's allowed. Mm -hmm. And we could expect that will continue. Mm -hmm. uh, and so though I think it will be easier having the permit tied to a property, I think mm -hmm. enforcement will pick up, but there's still going to be a lots of activity that probably has always been illegal and will continue to be illegal going forward. So I just want to be clear about and have everyone appreciate um, what the history suggests and what what that might suggest for the future. Uh, it will be good to talk with the chief, uh, uh, Moulton, about that because I think we would, it seems to me that if you have a notification process at the point of sale, then people are starting to realize that it's, and they have to read the respect your neighbor policy. Well, even if they are intent on setting the fireworks off on another day, uh, they might they might actually contact their neighbor and and yeah, perhaps you're right. So then we may get some benefit from this. Yep. So do I have a motion to table? Yeah, um, so moved. Second. Uh, discussion? No. Nope. All in favor? Good. Thank you, that's unanimous. Thank you, appreciate it. Okay. Next item is... Uh, oh, yes, thank you. Would mm -hmm. you, I'm sorry that Mark, I didn't... Mark McIntyre, I can live with a lot of noise from time to time. But the fireworks that concern me this past year, we were either in the drought or the beer drought. I don't know which it was. But my neighbor, and they're good neighbors, but never spoken. And the fireworks were all going off, and I'm thinking, such an easy thing to start a fire. Fire risk. You know, mm -hmm. any easy thing for a provision, that will allow for the cancellation I'm, I'm glad you raised that because it was uh, an additional point that is to be included and uh, it was to be discussed with uh, the fire chief next uh, next month but it is our intention to and the chiefs have suggested that we use the fire permit uh, restriction rules that are issued by the state so that when perm fire burn permits are not allowed to be issued, then fireworks permits will equally be uh, restricted in being issued. Thank you. I, I don't think. That was the one. <laughs> that, was actu that was actually, that was actually one, that was one of my points was that, and one of the reasons I wanted just to do it through the fire department 
was because they control whether or not their burn, per burn permits are allowed. And so that's why I wanted it to go through the fire department because they control whether burn permits are issued or not issued. Right. And I didn't want there to be any confusion anywhere else. So if anyone else was handling that, I wanted to make sure that if we're not going to let people burn, why are we letting them send off fireworks? No. I, I think I'd also like to point out that part of the draft language of the permit application says that I understand that this permit applies only to the dates listed above and may be revoked by the Scarborough Fire Department if weather conditions so warrant. So I think intense there. So, yeah, yeah. I, I think the follow through. So I think, but I think it's a great point. Great. Thank you. Uh, any other public comment on fireworks? Seeing none, we're going to move on to the next item on the agenda. Uh, this is a discussion on sign regulation, both content and placement. Uh, uh, we've got two components here. We have uh, a discussion of temporary signs uh, uh, being content neutral and we have a discussion on the placement of signs, uh, which I think probably got on the agenda when we talked about it originally. We spoke about the fact that when you look around and see uh, thousands of signs in town for a month, six weeks before elections and all mm -hmm. the debris and whatnot, that, that, that really brought, brought it to our attention. I've been working with Larissa Crockett, the assistant town manager, who has been researching some questions regarding signs. And Larissa, why don't you start off by filling us in on uh, what you've learned as far as the, uh, the law and restrictions sure. on uh, temporary signs so that we can sort of have a baseline of information as a committee. Sure, absolutely. So um, in 2015, the Supreme Court of the United States heard a, a case that was is titled Reed versus the Town of Gilbert, Arizona. It centered around a church that uh, did not have a home, so they consistently needed to put out signs directing people to their services that would rotate throughout the community. Um, Gilbert, Arizona had a sign ordinance that made different allowances for different styles of temporary signs, political, religious services, bean suppers, et cetera. And they did not favor the church. And so the church brought the case all the way up through to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court um, judges that the sign ordinance actually warrants what's called strict scrutiny because it is a, it could be potentially an infringement on First Amendment freedom of speech rights. So that ruling at the Supreme Court level sends every level of government scrambling to deal with their sign ordinances. So in that, um, in that ruling, however, in the judgment that they passed down, there's a concurring opinion from Justice Alito that is signed on by Kennedy and um, Sotomayor. And in that, Alito argues that that does not mean that municipalities have zero right to legislate signs. And he goes on to list a few general areas, one of which is location of sign placement. So I have spoken um, both with MMA's attorney, Richard Flewelling, and yesterday I spoke with a different attorney at MMA who's been spending a lot of t her time in municipal sign ordinance, Brianna Gerson. Um, and they both agree that as long as the town of Scarborough passes a sign ordinance that is completely content neutral, so that any sort of regulations that you impose are on temporary signs across the board, that there is no problem to be had there. That location is absolutely defendable um, for all temporary signs. Brianna Guerin, uh, Gerson rather, continued by saying that um, she would want us to be careful about making sure that when we're, when we're listing off types of signs that we mean that we could maybe talk about structures of signs. So instead of saying real estate signs or political signs or business signs, sandwich, you know, that we're saying A-frame signs, C 
single post signs, wire post signs, and letting those be the kind of categories that you're referencing so that you're not being, it's very clear that you're being content neutral. We don't care what is on your wire post sign, be it an advertisement for your bean supper or for your candidacy, they both are given equal um, restriction or, or freedom. Um, anything else you wanted to know about that background? Well, that's a good start because okay. that, that helps us all to sort of understand the groundwork here. Uh, as long as, uh, and, and this is what got the people in Arizona in trouble, they said these church signs couldn't be as large as the other people, or the, the realtor signs or the other uh, temporary signs. And so they're going, what's, what's with this? We're, 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 we're having these tiny little signs and somebody else is allowed to have larger uh, 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 signs. So uh, as long as, I think as Larissa said, we stay with, uh, uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a bean supper, it doesn't matter whether it's a realtor, it doesn't matter whether it's a referendum question, it doesn't matter whether it's a political candidate. <coughs> uh, there, the limitations will be the same for all of them, but that it's okay to say uh, uh, if you're putting them in uh, uh, or near a wetland area and they might blow into the wetlands, that's disruptive of the environmental condition. Uh, if you're putting them, uh, 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 congesting them around an intersection, when people are trying to go through that intersection, and, and looking to see who's running for town auditor, that's a hazardous condition. Uh, and I've heard lots of people say, gee, that's, uh, that's exactly what I've done. I was meaning to see what did that sign say? And I went through and I wasn't paying as much attention. Uh, I think those are the kinds of things. Uh, the state has adopted, am I correct, a 30-foot separation. Yes, so the state went through, um, as soon as Gilbert came down, the state within Section 21A has political um, transportation guidelines, I think are in 21A, regarding um, signs in the right-of-way. And they went through and they changed all of the state language to make it entirely content neutral. So the state language has been updated. So in the state language it now says a sign with similar message may not be placed more than 30 feet um, from one another. When speaking with um, uh, the MMA attorney, she suggested that that, of course, is very difficult to enforce. Um, people are not out there with their measuring sticks. Um, so she suggested that you could incorporate language that said something along the lines of no more than one temporary sign within the right of way of each property unit. So you could, um, you know, somebody can't, in their own property, they of course may blanket their front yard with signs, that's their personal property, but within the right of way, you can't have somebody just pull over and put down a bunch of signs. And that way you're not worrying about measurement for enforcement purposes, you're better able to judge, I see one house, lots of land, and 20 signs in the right of way, this is a violation. Okay, and, mm -hmm. and obviously uh, this whole issue of uh, uh, setback or distances apart, uh, sounds like it's trying to address the whole issue of proliferation. Uh, 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 that uh, here we have, and we've seen it in the, in the, along the marsh, there were, there must have been a hundred signs uh, uh, across the Scarborough Marsh or more uh, by uh, 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 one or two candidates. And that, you know, people push back. I mean, I got a lot of uh, uh, comments about that, and I, I, you know, and I, uh, I know all of us have run for office and been candidates, and we felt pressure to keep up, uh, and you feel the need to, you know, uh, if there are popular spots on a corner <laughs> or uh, 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 in the center of town, you want to have as many signs as everybody else, mm -hmm. and so you end up. Uh, 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 having uh, a lot of signs, and you're just you're adding to the problem. I felt like I was adding to the problem in the fashion. So uh, the state has set a 30-foot separation, but I would be willing to consider uh, 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 greater distance. Uh, the lot line issue suggested by MMA 
That, of course, then presumes that you can figure that out. Absolutely. It would be a guideline. I mean, it thinks that it definitely gets tricky. People don't know where the lot lines are, certainly. But I think that the intent there is saying, you know, most people can see that's one house. Yes. And therefore, in front of the right of way of that one house, I may not put more than one sign. Yes. So I think it's a fairly easily understood by the people that are wishing to place signs. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, all enforcement is subject to human judgment. And um, the people that are set to enforce the ordinance would then have to just make good judgment. How do you guys yes. feel about that? Well, uh, of the, are we specifically talking about the, the one lot, the yeah, one we'll sign? Yeah, for the moment, we'll kind of, we'll, we'll go, you know, the uh, distance apart for one lot, and then we'll talk about setbacks from intersections as being a public safety hazard, and then we'll talk about <coughs> wetlands, limitations on vista views and wetlands. Uh, yeah, if anyone, is, is there anyone, a uh, member of the public who would like to be able to speak? I'm, I'm a member now, right? Because I'm a yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, so Katie Foley, Three Lucky Lane. Um, so this is an issue that uh, I've now been involved in two really big campaigns in my lifetime here in Scarborough, and I hate the signs. I absolutely hate the signs. It's the absolute truth. Um, I recognize that they're absolutely necessary, uh, political that is, I'm, forget everything else. Um, but I would be super supportive, and if you noted this year, um, I didn't place a single sign in the marsh purposely because that's a wind tunnel. Uh, I've, I have found signs from candidates two and three years later, uh, you know, at, when I was doing a part of a, a marsh cleanup. So I would love to see us be really mindful of environmental areas for sure in terms of restriction. Um, all of that said, I, I think I would just be also careful as you craft the conversation because uh, it can also be construed as in some ways trying to hamper uh, a candidate's opportunity too. So I'd love to see less signs. I wish signs were not part of the political process. Um, they are. Uh, and then in terms of real estate, um, we need those signs. <laughs> so uh, be very uh, careful about how you talk about that piece too. But yeah, no more signs in the marsh. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't use signs. I mean, I didn't, just to be honest, I mean, I mean, I won my second campaign with one sign in my front yard. I mean, so I don't, I don't, we, I mean, we joke about it. You're unique, I think. Um, but I, I personally don't, I hate signs. I think they're tacky and I think they, they, they make our beautiful town look terrible. Um, I think when you, we see certain areas in town that are beautiful and you've got 50 signs all clumped up together, it looks awful. I personally would, I, I would, I would actually vote to get rid of all signs all together, um, minus signs that need to be up for churches or real estate or that type of stuff. I think I find that different mm -hmm. because I don't think those are all clumped together, you know, you know, who's got the bigger sign, who's got the brighter sign. It's like a competition, like you said. It's like mm -hmm. people are trying to one up each other. Mm -hmm. Who's got a how big can we get? You yeah. know, I mean it's just crazy to me. Yeah. And it just it, it it marks up everything in town. People hate it. Yeah. Um and so, I mean, I'll, I, I'll look towards, I guess, your, both of your direction on this because in my feeling, I would be just as happy to get rid of signs altogether. I personally will not vote for um, signs. The one place I will not go for is signs in any um, environmental area at all. So anything that has to do with the marsh, the beaches in that area, I don't want to see a sign anywhere near there. Um, other than that, I'll look towards you guys because I would, the mind frame that I'm in, I would get rid of <laughs> political signs in the town of Scarborough altogether. So I'll look at you guys for direction. So I think, I think there, so there are two, two things that, that uh, I'd like to respond to, uh, although I would like to say that Katie, you had very nice signs uh, in the last election. Um, actually, there are three things, because one of the things that I noticed about um, Katie in particular, she had some really large wooden signs mm -hmm. that I think we'd have a hard time defining as necessarily temporary 
um, right. or, or, or like other large signs in general because they're not wireframe, they're not single, single post. Um, uh, so I think we might have, some, have a harder time I don't know if there's a way to address that. There is. The state actually does pretty clearly. You can address the, the language for temporary signs is, is, is pretty easy to lay out. It's a sign that, for instance, you guys actually have a sign permitting process for a permanent sign. Right. So you could not, Katie Foley uh, may have the best signs out there, but she can't erect one at her place of business or so forth without a permit from the town. So we've covered the idea of permanent sign in mm -hmm. some way through our code enforcement. Um, so temporary signs, though, the state has language, other communities have language that make it clear that the, the, there is intent of a temporary nature with it. Gotcha. So even those large, um, you know, sheet of plywood signs, they are, they are still intended to be temporary. And I believe the state even has language that references the size of a sheet of plywood in their definitions of gotcha. temporary signs. That's the maximum size. Yes. Four by, four by eight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that said, I also think that they're, they're an eyesore, you know, year of signs excluded. Uh, but uh, uh, in general, I don't, I don't particularly care for them. Um, so that's, that addresses that one, so thank you. Uh, the next point was around uh, banning all political signs. I think um, I'd be okay with that, but I feel like what you said, that that's probably not something that we would pass muster. That would be in strict violation of Reed versus Gilbert, and we would be in, the, the ordinance would be undefendable, even though the sentiment, I'm sure, is fairly universally shared. Um, the whole idea is that you can't ban one type of sign. Right. right. Uh, and then right. all right. signs would be, would mean that realtors would then have trouble, and so that's probably not something that we want to do. So you're okay. saying because of the, because of that, we can't, we can't ban political signs? Absolutely not, because that would be a, that would be an infringement of freedom of speech. So you can you can regulate where it has to be across the board regulation so that the real estate agent's temporary sign, because that's what it, that is, it's there for a purpose of selling a home, is under the same level of regulation as the candidate's sign. And that that's how that goes. That makes me really proud. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> but but you're, what you're getting at is Taking my toys and going you're on. starting to understand this whole uh, Reed case, that it, it, you cannot discriminate in favor of realtor and bean suppers to the detriment of a political candidate or a referendum. It's like uh, so issue. different, though. I mean, they're not even, and, and they're not even on the same, they're not even in the same and, hemisphere. And, and that comes but they're all under the rubric well, of the First Amendment. So, but we can regulate where they can be. So we could be very, very tough about where political signs can be. No. Well, so again, you can't call Why? it political as a class. Because no. they can, you can be very strict about where temporary signs may be. But, but that's you, a political sign. It's any sign that's not there permanently with a permit. Yes. So that would political be including political. Oh, including political. So, but Katie, uh, Kate, uh, Councilor St. Clair, you may find, um, Joy in that there is very strong precedent for ordinance protecting ecologically and um, kind of culturally important vistas and areas. So if the town of Scarborough wished to have an extremely stringent um, ordinance that did not allow any placement of temporary signs whatsoever along the marsh and any other ecologically sensitive or um, just enjoyable scenic view areas that would stand up to, um, according to MMA, they feel strongly that that would stand up to any sort of scrutiny and that it actually wouldn't even come under that kind of strict scrutiny, freedom of speech um, kind of level, but what they called instead intermediate scrutiny, that, and that there's a lot of um, support and precedent set for the town having the right to say, not here. And the real estate agents wouldn't be upset. The real estate agents aren't selling the marsh. So there's no way for me to write in an ordinance <coughs> the difference between a temporary sign of a political nature and a temporary sign of anything else. Not since the Supreme Court said you may not. No, that's the problem. So I, I, Sorry, I, have, one, I, I have one more thing. No. And the other thing that we, that we had on the table was the, the one uh, sign in the right of way per lot. And I'm, I'm in favor of that. I think that would cut down on the number of signs. I don't think it would infringe upon anything Again, because the, the realtor if, could put as many signs as they want on the property itself outside of the right of way. Um, I, I mean, I think that's uh, uh, as intelligent a way so that, yeah, you want one sign, you get one sign. 
because we're only talking about the public right of way. Remember, mm -hmm. uh, you can have 20 signs on your lawn, mm -hmm. and you can have 20 signs on your friend's lawns. So, the, uh, but only one from one candidate, right? No, you as an independent homeowner, if that's your property, you have the right to. But what if it's property. his? What oh. if what if Will right. and I are both running? Can we both put it in the right of way in, in front of? Way. Yes, actually, that is the kind of the catch there because you are regulating. You can't say one temporary sign. You can say one temporary sign with similar message, well, it, per lot. So that would still allow somebody to go. So if let's say that everyone agrees that um, Councillor Donovan has the most ideal lot in which to place a sign. Everyone has the right within the right of way in front of his home to place one of their signs. So you still may have patches if you have a very contentious, if you have a really full ballot that year with five different yeah. um, citizen initiatives, and uh -huh. you're still going to have a lot of signs, uh -huh. but there is a, you will have fewer, and you won't have the kind of blanket of and, one candidate. And you understand my frustration is not with you. Oh, good. Because yeah. I know I'm being I'm being a, a I can real take it. L. It's okay. Uh, it just frustrates me when I, it drives me crazy when that when this is our town, you know what I mean? Like we want to make it, we want to keep it as beautiful as it is, and it drives me nuts when other entities are telling us how we have to maintain it. Larissa, uh, is it uh, um, clear that we cannot regulate on? the private property, because I actually am thinking we, we, we actually do have the right to regulate on private property signage, so. You have the right to regulate permitted signs on private property. I, I have not discussed that with so them. So let's, let's do this. Why got in sync would be that's that, a dangerous that act. Larissa has a good contact in the MMA legal department, uh, and uh, it, it might be, because I'd be fine with one sign uh, on mm -hmm. somebody's property, but if all of a sudden we say, uh, after we adopt something, now we start seeing 10 signs on somebody's mm -hmm. property, all for the same candidate, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and they, all they did was they moved back, the right of ways are about 50 feet, mm -hmm. so they're only talking about moving of probably five or eight feet back. Mm -hmm. The next thing we know, we, we're being frustrated in our effort to try and, uh, you know, so, I guess, I, can, if, uh, no, you're the counselor, I'll be quiet. No, I, I'd like to hear you. Go I guess away. that makes me, I, I will certainly discuss it in May at your direction. That makes me very, just from an ordinance standpoint, I think when you are looking at, do you also get to then, at that point, I'm, a, if I'm thinking immediately, are you going to now regulate how many flamingos I may have? How many what? Fl pink flamingos I may have on my lawn? or how many Easter egg decorations I may put up at Easter. I think that when you start to try to write ordinance that regulates the number of units of something on somebody's personal lawn that they have chosen to place, it, I think that at that point your ordinance... Well, that's a good question to investigate is that everyone has some ornamental slash landscaping elements to their house. Uh, and is there a difference between uh, ornamental landscaping and signage? Uh, uh, because I, w I would say what we're regulating is signage. We don't really much right. care about how they landscape or decorate their house. Because that's just that's part of their own personal expression of how they want their property to look. If they have but we're talking temporary signs. It's, we're talking a sign. They're talking about a permanent flamingo. We're talking about a temporary sign. Right. So... I'll leave that to you to, to sure. uh, research that for us, if you would. I, th I, I, I think well. I, I think I'm less concerned about what what's actually on the private property because the the homeowner or the property owner has the discretion to remove them if they're not um, if they're somebody else's signs or or they 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 have control over what goes in there. The right of way they don't. Um, so the uh, like so the it has area to be at Hannaford and like those right. areas Hannaford that drives me consulted. crazy. Yeah. But Amato is never that's consulted. No, do you know what I'm <laughs> saying? That's in the right of way, though. If it, if it's, it, can't, it can't move back 10 feet because then the, the property owner can say, no, I don't so want to. So we're saying there. that, like, those areas, because they're the right of way, we would, we would be able to limit only one sign being there. One sign. So you're going to have people out at 1201 
No, no, <laughs> one, one time per message, so per candidate. Yeah. So if Bill and I run it against each other, it would be Bill could have one, I could have one. Right, and everybody right. else is running. Okay. But is my interpretation correct about the, the right of way? Like, you're in the right of way. I don't, I don't have a say about what you put there. The town has the right to say that they don't wish to have um, temporary signs, because we're being content neutral, temporary signs within the right of way in front of public buildings. So there's, there is some, er, there are some, and that would be the same thing as in your ecological areas. So the right of way in general is thought of public, mm -hmm. as public space, which is why signs have been able to be placed there. But the town does have the authority to regulate location, including not wishing to have sign, temporary signs placed within the right of way in front of town-owned spaces. I guess, I guess what I meant was my interpretation of the uh, my, my right to the private owner. So I, right I, can't, I can't remove signs that are in the right of way. That is illegal, my property. but it's equally illegal. Or, or, or definitely not, they have no right for somebody who is not you and without your permission to place their signs on your personal property. You have the full authority as a private property owner to remove those signs. Yeah, a lot of the, uh, 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 there were several opinions, concurring opinions, mm -hmm. because they just couldn't all agree. The Supreme Court was really mm -hmm. kind of divided in how they wanted, and ha ha several of them didn't like the strict uh, uh, interpretation that the majority ended up Thomas's opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, and they said it should be more like if there's a good rationale for why you're restricting, like in front of town hall, not a good idea. No. You know, in front of the library, not a good idea. Mm -hmm. In front of a Vista View, not a good idea. They said that's enough. That ought to be the, uh, the basis on which you can, you can do this. So uh, I think we've got some latitude and what we're saying is one per lot yep. will reserve for further in the right discussion away. in the right of way whether uh, we, and we'll get more information from Larissa on personal property, uh, 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 individuals' private property. Uh, and, uh, and we'll try and develop a list of, because we have to be specific, we have to have an yeah. exhibit that yep. would recite all the Vista views and areas, wetlands the, and the all marsh that and we'd like to be able to protect. So we'll 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 do that. Yeah, I think it's going to have to be uh, protected very areas. specific in terms of from here to there. Yeah, we're going to have to find or right, where, where, where does the, the marsh end and uh, where does it? And we'll stop. probably do it by lot numbers. Probably addresses might be a way right. to do it. Okay. You also have Street. GIS capacity at this point, so you could even narrow it uh -huh. down because lots are subject to change, but through subdivision or or, or right. so forth. So you right. could right. mark it down through coordinates. Yeah. Uh, uh, how practical is that right. for someone? How do they think? Uh, how would I know? Well, well, up how as a companion piece, the corner of this road and this road, which happens to be coordinates yeah. X and Y. Yeah. One way or another, we're going to have to be very okay. clear and discreet. So we'll clearly, work. this needs so a lot more work. Now and yeah. Between now yeah. and April. We'll work on that. Yeah. Now the, the third piece is, uh, you have one more point? On oh, no, I had another piece, but I'll, right. I'll, I'll be the on the public safety first. part of allowing them to sort of gang up on the corner right. on intersections. Uh, to me, that that part really concerns me from a public safety point of view. We're going to get a lot, we're still going to have a lot of signs. <laughs> and they are going to be along these long roadways, but to get them uh, away from our town center. It just drives me crazy to see. I agree. Uh, so well, there's existing authority, and I don't know exactly where it is, but if there are site restrictions, if there's a public safety hazard as a result of a sign, someone pulls to an intersection and cannot see safely up or down the road. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about line of sight mm -hmm. uh, problems. I'm talking about just driver distraction problems. There's like 40 signs in this little medium, and I'm like, you can't help but not look at it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you're sitting at a traffic intersection and you're supposed to be paying attention to what's in front of you on the road, but you're kind of like, what I is think that? If we you know? I mean, you're, you can't help but go there. I would say a setback, and I don't know what it should be. I don't know. I think this needs a lot more but, um, discussion. But what? From the intersection itself. Councilor Donovan, would that be from any intersection, or would you be able to, if the concern is um, major intersections like along Route 1 with Black Point Road and, and so forth, because if you're talking about any intersection in town, 
I think that that may become um, a bit of a nightmare when you're in kind of your more rural areas, smaller streets that are intersecting with smaller streets, and it's somebody's property line. Like then, I think that that may become a bit complicated. Well, it, it's definitely going to have to be respectful of the people who put out the occasional sign. And I'm thinking about church parking, you know, and you'll see it on the corner saying, go down this way. Open uh, houses. Open houses. Go down yeah, this way. Yeah. Th those are all ones that require... Intersection. Uh, so maybe what we're talking about is Route 1, and uh, and maybe what we should do is, Tom, kind of work up a list for the next meeting of major intersections in the community that uh, we'd be well served to have the public safety ex uh, sort of supersede uh, the right to put signs out. And we could work but on just that. Be careful. I, I'm not sure public safety is the right rationale to use. I think it's visually offensive or distasteful is what I'm hearing. I'm, if there's oh. a legitimate public safety concern that we can articulate, that's, I think, a different conversation. Well, I think it's a, it's a driver distraction. Okay, that's the... It's a driver distraction because they're congregating, and these are primarily Route 1, uh, Route 114, uh, mm. <coughs> Pleasant Hill and Route 1. So, yeah. Uh, Dunstan. Dunstan. Pegasus. So I why don't I guess. well we can identify why don't we sort of come come to the next meeting with a list? Yep. Uh, I, I wonder if I could add. I've heard medians as well, like in, signs in the median. Yes. Being under the same. That's what bugs me. Kind of distraction. Just yeah. Driver distractible. Right, and it, it peop, and people have to run over and fix them, and they're pulling off the side of the road. Oh yeah. And and they're yeah. Having done it, I, I know it's that scary. there is a danger involved. So yeah. uh, I think that's a good suggestion is uh, median. Uh, all right, so all right, so we'll come back. Can I make a motion to table this? Yep. I, hold on, I have one more, oh. one more that oh, okay. I, I haven't heard yet, and maybe, maybe it's been addressed before, but because um, I wasn't at the last meeting. But what, what were we thinking about as our enforcement mechanism for this? I mean, I feel like. The, it, uh, uh, well, uh, <clears throat> Larissa and I talked about how you could just say um, uh, people are limited to at one time having X number of signs out, but the problem with that is then somebody's going to go around and count them, and that's just not workable. Oh, uh, well, some people the, will. Um, the limitation of having signs in certain places has fallen to Tony. Yeah. I mean, if I have somebody put signs out to me <coughs> and they're within 30 feet of each other, Tony will send me a note, uh, oh, a signs, yeah. call, and just say, uh, you know, you got two signs that are side by side. And that's because uh, here before it's really been election law that uh, that that that's the guiding law. Right. We're now talking about. An oh, ordinance. Ordinance. So it may be able to transition or yeah, be pull into that code enforcement and or law enforcement. Do you, do you think code enforcement? Code, I would say code enforcement. Is the right way to go here? That's typically not their function, but um, I see Lar Larissa shaking her head now. The code enforcement is their function is for permitting the signs. So we enforce that. They have the right to enforce if you have failed to secure a permit for something that our um, Regulations require you to permit. Um, currently, you do cur you have a town of Scarborough ordinance regulating political signs in the public right of way. Now, it is in total violation of Reed versus Gilbert, so it's, it doesn't actually work any longer. Which, which means we also have to. Uh, You'll have to repeal. Repeal it. Yes, repeal any place. So that's another element. <laughs> um, but y in that ordinance. In Councilor Rowan, you actually already have language um, in Section 3. This ordinance shall be enforced by the Scarborough Police Department. In addition to seeking penalties under Section 2, which is a, punish it's a fine of $250 per day for the oh infraction, um, any officer of the Scarborough Police Department may remove or cause the removal of any sign located in the right-of-way in violation of the ordinance. So in the past, you've chosen to have this be police enforceable. You've given your police department not just the right to fine, but also the right to remove when something is in violation. So I would suggest, if my opinion is wished, 
I think this is enforceable by the police. I think that they are the ones that are out and about. Um, it also may help to I redirect that's traffic. Good. I, 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 respectfully I that's disagree. A, that's, <laughs> yeah, we Sorry. can talk about that. It's, it's more a manager of manpower and, and who best is do what a task dealing with. Code enforcement does some level of enforcement with temporary signs yeah. today. I assure you if you go into any of their vehicles, there are dozens yeah. in the back seat. And yeah. And I'll just say, I, was, I have been a police officer, and, I, and I, when I was doing it, I can't even imagine if on my list of things that I had to learn and deal with and function on a daily basis, if all of a sudden you guys came to me and said, okay, now you have to deal with um, managing signs, I'd be like, what? Right. You know? So let, let me confer with staff and we can come back to you with in terms of Good. Uh, yeah, I with whom should the enforcement say? Okay. okay. And I already made a motion to table it. I'll second the motion. Okay. Uh, we'll let uh, uh, Tom and Marissa kind of uh, uh, start to develop a draft and, uh, and the discussion points for the next meeting. Uh, so all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Good discussion. And would it be feasible it's maybe if in between the meeting, if you guys, if the three of you have something that you are working on, maybe if we Let's could get copies get of it before the meeting, exactly. we might be able that to kind of hammer will, some of it out before. That will be a goal is to be able to have a, a working draft that'd be great. distributed. Yeah, that'd be awesome. So that people can actually comment yeah. uh, on it and we can then collect the comments and, and make sure that they're dealt with. Thank you. At the meeting. That's a good idea. Uh, Okay, uh, discussion on lighting and a good neighbor ordinance. Uh, let me see where. The background on this uh, is that we have a noise ordinance mm -hmm. that protects uh, uh, people in residential areas from unreasonable noise. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we've included in the package that was distributed a draft of a light nuisance mm -hmm. ordinance based on uh, some rough editing that I did of a bit of research that Larissa found a good, what I thought was I read all of the ones that she provided as examples and then picked the one that I thought was uh, most suited and then I edited it so that it, so that one we have at least uh, as a point of discussion. Uh, what we also, uh, uh, Larissa and I talked about was the fact that what we could do here is take the light nuisance, which matches up very well with noise. Those are thing, two things that can be very annoying in residential settings. And the third thing is derelict property. Yeah, and we've we've we know where they are in town, and mm -hmm. and they and I'm sure they're the vein of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, and when Larissa and I talked about it, we were not talking about uh, whether your lawn is, you know, cut to three or four inches, and you've got a good Bermuda grass. We were talking more in terms of uh, a serious disrepair, uh, unregistered vehicles in your yard, uh, uh, a lot of debris, things of that nature. And that what we could do is kind, uh, combine all three of these, noise, lighting disturbances, and uh, a good neighbor policy on some reasonable maintenance of your yard into a good neighbor ordinance, which Larissa has some experience in Acton, where, where they have one and is aware that it exists elsewhere. So that's kind of the backdrop. Uh, public comment on any of this? Jeff, yeah. Right, yeah, that way you We just need the, your name and address, get, sir. Get the um, microphone, picks it up. <coughs> yeah, my name's Kevin McQuinn. I live at 17 Williamsburg Lane. And I also have a couple of commercial properties, one in Pine Point and one in the Industrial Park. Um, and this, the lighting piece here, um, this was something that uh, last summer 
Um, I, I, I have a serious issue with a neighbor um, who put up three huge uh, floodlights and never turns them off. So the sun never sets on my house. Oh my God. And um, so m my experience is, you know, I'm in the uh, commercial real estate business. I served on the Portland Planning Board when I lived there. So I understand what photometrics are and what people are allowed and what people are allowed at the property lines. Um, I'm, I'm aware of light pollution that we have everywhere, whether it's, uh, I, I know how nice it is to look at the stars if you're in East Port or Lubeck compared to if you're in downtown Portland. Um, and so I made an appointment and I came in and I met with Dan uh, mm -hmm. Bacon because the, from, I read through the ordinance and what I understood was that we do have an ordinance about lighting, but it only refers to commercial property. Correct. Um, at the, if there are, uh, commercial property side by side, there's a certain standard that w w um, a measurement that is, you know, foot candles of light that are allowed to spill from one to the other. Um, if it's a residential property abutting a commercial property, then there's another uh, a number, which is about 50% of the commercial to commercial. Um, and I'm not an engineer. I, I did all this work several months ago. So um, I borrowed a light meter from uh, a friend of mine, um, Tim Napolitano, who's an electrician yeah. in Greater Portland. Yeah. And, um, I, and I was able to measure the foot candles at the property line. And um, at my house, uh, you know, next to a residence, there should be like, the, thing, the meter should read about, should read five at the property line. At my house, it reads 14. So it's almost 300% more than would be allowed if there was an Irving Oil next to my house. Um, as I said, this neighbor of mine, um, when we moved in, um, there's plenty, of, uh, the, the lots are nice. It's, uh, Williamsburg Lane's a nice little neighborhood. There's cul-de-sac at yeah. the end. I'm almost at the end. The Benjamin Farm is in our backyard. Yeah. We bought this house because of the, uh, because of Benjamin Farm, actually, we, I've snowshoed eight times in the last two weeks out there. That's amazing. Um, but the lights never go off. At night, I can't go out there and, you know, and look at the stars. I can't go out there and just enjoy myself. It's just, it's ridiculous. Can I ask you a quick question? Is that okay with you? Yeah, go right ahead. Um, have you tried talking to them about yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. It's Tom Ranello. He's a realtor in town. The oh, most yeah. unrenewed reasonable person yeah. I've ever met. Okay, I was just going to say, the, I, yeah, I know who that is, but so I'm going to save I, my when talk. When we moved in, just so you know the background, when we moved in, um, there, uh, it was, there's 15 feet between our kitchen window, dining room window, and their driveway. And we had a Ron Forrest, nice six-foot scalloped Ron Forrest fence put up, beautiful fence, um, and they didn't like the fact that we put a fence up. Um, and I'm telling you, we were looking right into their garages, and the cars were right outside our windows. Yeah. It didn't seem unreasonable yeah. um, to us anyway. And, you know, he made this comment that it's not going to be that easy to get rid of me. <gasps> Two weeks later, he put up lighting, these floodlights, um, on the gable end of the house at about 20 feet. And they've been there now for, it's been over a year. Um, so I did go to Dan and I asked him, you know, what do you think? Um, you know, I want to do this right. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I'm not going to overreact. I want to go through the proper channels here. What do we need to do? And he sent me to see Sergeant O'Malley. Mm -hmm. And Sergeant O'Malley came to my house. I gave him a presentation on my laptop. I showed him pictures from two o'clock in the morning. I showed him pictures of during the seventh game of the World Series at at midnight. I could read a magazine sitting at my dining room table uh, with no lights on in the house, just from the lights coming, coming through, um, uh, through the windows. And, uh, you know, I really at my wit's end. Um, I did research too. Um, you know, I found a lighting ordinances around the country, uh, residential, you know, what certain standards were. This, this five number is a standard that is pretty much everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, the state of Maine happens to be one of four states in the, in the whole country that does have a, a, a lighting ordinance. It actually has a what's called a light trespass, and no building, no house, no apartment complex in Maine can be built using state funds, uh, meaning 
you know, bonds floated or main state housing yeah. um, uh, without meeting certain standards. And those standards are all, you know, they're, they're all written somewhere. Is there anything in the state ordinance that he's um, violating? That what? Is there anything in the state ordinance that he's violating? No, because the state ordinance only pertains to properties that were financed with state oh, okay. money. okay. I'm sorry. So if a new apartment complex goes up that's financed through um, Main State Housing, yep. or if somebody's building, uh, you know, if Main State Housing is involved in habitat houses, they have a certain standard that they have to, to meet. And they're reasonable standards. Yeah. Um, wow. This gable end of the, of the house that has the light on it. Mm -hmm. For instance, um, the, the garage, uh, this, the back of the garage comes way down, the front of the garage only comes a little bit. Now, in all these ordinances at the, our state and around the country, the, the standard is that the lighting in that driveway to, to light for safety and what have you uh, should be at the same point as the lowest um, soffit. So there's a soffit here, a soffit here, and the architect, 20 years ago, the light that they had there before they decided to add this light was right where there are design standards yeah. that reasonable people adhere to. And, um, and architects build for and design because they understand, you know, they try to build into a home uh, the things that will make the home uh, a good neighbor too. So... Um, I do, uh, I do wonder about one piece here is that um, I was a little bit surprised uh, when I had Officer O'Malley at my house. Um, he explained to me that um, noise uh, is one thing. Noise, uh, it's the, the Cumberland County mm -hmm. um, District Attorney's Office. If somebody creates a real problem with noise, then they can be written up arrested and tried, uh, it's a disorderly conduct. I always thought it was disturbing the peace, but apparently there's no such thing as disturbing the peace. It's a disorderly conduct charge. Um, uh, Mr. Ranello tells me, told me that, uh, and he had done the research here somewhere, he, he came and talked to someone and said he could build a lighthouse in his garage, in his driveway, and shine it on my house and there's not a thing I could do about it. And he used a couple of F-bombs in there when he told me this. Um, he's just not a good person. And, you know, I need some protections. I think that it's unreasonable that, uh, you know, we have these great standards that, that are reasonable and practical when you have a commercial building and a house or a commercial building and a commercial building. But there is no standard from house to house. There's no ordinance. There's no, I have no protection. Have you, uh, have you looked at the uh, materials that were online? That, uh, there's a package of materials that accompany the agenda for the ordinance committee? I, I, I saw some of that. You, I saw where you had gotten things in uh, some ordinance in California. Um, I had sent Dan Bacon stuff from Texas, California, and then I think uh, it was months after that that I found out, I, I got the information on the state of Maine. Um, and that we we have those that law. I, I mean, I think the uh, I think the committee sounds to me like it's uh, oh, yeah. interested in having a protection. Uh, you bring up, you know, candle power. Uh, the ordinance has drafted the the kind of just as a uh, example of something that might be done. It uses more of a narrative. Uh, uh, expression of what the what the uh, legal standard is uh, lighting within a residential zone between the hours of dusk to dawn shall not occur in a manner that it spills out over or onto neighboring residential properties to the degree of intensity or duration of operation that it interferes with the peaceful enjoyment of the property of such neighboring landholders or unreasonably disturbs the comfort and repose of the neighboring landowners as to constitute a nuisance. I did like that language. I, I thought that was very good. I like, the, I'd like it too. I do too. This is the issue. Uh, Dan Bacon said that it's not likely that if this is in the ordinance, uh, if this is a, um, 
an ordinance in, on the, as far as development goes in the B2 zone or what, what have you, uh, building standards and so forth, that he doesn't see that being enforced by, by code enforcement. Um, that's why he sent me to Sergeant O'Malley. Mm -hmm. Sergeant O'Malley is the one who told me that, you know, he was going to speak with somebody in the district attorney's office, I guess as a liaison attorney. So, uh, not to interrupt you, sir, but sorry, the chairman, but if we put this ordinance in place, this will stop. So that's what, regardless yeah. of anything else going on, you just need to understand that if we put this ordinance in place the way that Councillor Donovan just read it, right. he will, the, that will stop. And a, and will and a police officer will be able to go to his house. Right. And so with the noise piece. End of story for him. He told uh, Officer uh, Sergeant O'Malley told me that um, you know if there's discretion on the part of the police officer. So if I'm having a graduation party for my daughter, right, that's we gonna understand. Happen one time, yes. it's, it's over at 10:30. Right. Nobody's gonna, you know, if I. All, if all police officers have the right to use discretion at certain right. times, but obviously you, there's a history with you and Sergeant O'Malley. And my suggestion to you is as soon as this ordinance is passed and goes through, that you contact Sergeant O'Malley and say, and he will be aware of it, and get the ball rolling. I just want to make sure that when this thing gets implemented that there is that recourse. There, that there will be. There are standards that, and people know uh, the police department or, you know, code enforcement, whoever, knows where the process needs to go. Yes, they will, they will, yes. This is not the first time that we've had an ordinance that has come up because there's been issues in town and it's been handled as soon as the ordinance takes place. Okay. So. Hey, thank you. All right, uh, I have, thank you for, that, that was good. Uh, Tom, th any thoughts on the uh, enforcement piece? The way it was drafted, uh, it says, uh, Upon written complaint alleging violation, the town's code enforcement officer shall investigate. Mm -hmm. uh, written notice given to the owner, giving them 15 days mm -hmm. to abate. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, in its pure sense, it's a, it, it would be a land use violation. The mm -hmm. problem is, from a practical point of view, this occurrence is happening after working hours, and so mm -hmm. code enforcement isn't here to respond and to view. Right. So. I think that's why Dan is suggesting not that he's looking to shirk responsibility from a practical matter, particularly for, for light, it's occurring when they're not here. Right. Yeah. And I think generally the same is true with noise. It happens weekends, nights, you know. So maybe we need to rework the uh, complaint process in the draft. I and would. Beyond that, just anecdotally from my perspective, I'm not aware that this is a widespread problem. I think l largely folks have learned to either deal with their neighbors and sometimes it's not possible. In other cases, they're resigned to the fact that it is the way it is, and we, that's why we don't hear. So I'm not saying there's not a problem, but I'm not aware that it's kind of widespread. It hasn't emanated to the point of... It would be nice to have... Here here tonight. It certainly will be nice to have a tool mm -hmm. that will allow us to deal with this kind of situation, Correct. which is unacceptable. I agree. Um, Dan, so we met in the fall, Dan, Sergeant O'Malley, myself, and Brian Longstaff, about this, and my understanding, and Tom, please correct me if I'm if I'm misremembering, they were hoping to have a double enforcement opportunity, so that there would be language within the performance standards, so that code enforcement can catch new housing being built and make sure that, um, as the gentleman was suggesting, that um, exterior safety lighting is is placed in accordance with things like at the lowest soffit line. Um, so that there's a there's a two pronged approach to enforcement. One is trying to catch them before they are built so that somebody is not building a house with lighting that's going to be out of code, um, but then that there would be that second piece because of what Tom was saying, that the, the infractions happen at night. So I think that they were hoping to have two branches of ordinance, one that would be lodged within the performance standards and one that would be standalone within whether it's within a good neighbor ordinance or something else that would be enforceable by police. Gotcha. Will. Oh, I was just going to say, so the uh, um I'm sorry, I didn't catch your last name. Kevin McQuinn. McQuinn. Well, Mr. McQuinn uh, was talking about the, what I, one thing that I did pick up on was having a, a quantifiable metric um, might be nice to, to be, you know, we talk about things being a nuisance, but some of those things are fairly subjective. So, um, um, yeah, th there's, a, there's a, clearly a way to measure the, the quantity of light at the property's edge. 
complications with our with that are yeah. we need to have the proper equipment. It, it may need to be calibrated. Right. I mean, we don't have that. I, there are difficulties with noise meters for all those sorts of reasons. So mm -hmm. um, I understand your point. Having the definitive standard, you know, is infallible. Uh, but there's also some practical challenges with making sure that whoever responds is equipped with the right equipment, they know they're trained, properly trained to use it, so on and so forth. So I, I happen to like this more narrative approach and albeit subjective, um, a reasonable person should be able to discern it. I agree with you. Uh, so uh, why don't we, uh, picking up on Larissa's point, we'll try and work uh, both uh, yeah. standards in, yeah. that, that's not something that's in the current draft, but we can do that. Yeah. Uh, You're saying the double enforcement? Yep, yeah. double yeah. enforcement. I think we uh, need to rewrite it. Uh, uh, we can do that. We can also uh, make sure that, that the subjective qualitative test mm -hmm. that's described is sufficiently robust that it gives a police officer mm -hmm. or a code enforcement officer the ability to say, you're going to have to, you're going to have to screen that. Yeah. You're going to have to eliminate that light. You're going to have to lower it. Uh, uh, there's, there's you just. Know, there, there could be other ways, and I'm not saying this is better. But, um, you know, the light can't cast a shadow, so you think it's property line. Those sorts of things don't require a, you know, a piece a of meter, equipment, right. but it's a, it either does or it doesn't. Uh, I so agree. There, there's maybe other ways if what what's right here. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know if that's reasonable. Maybe there are occasions where yeah, the light needs to be intense yes. enough yeah, that it does have a shadow. Work in progress. Yeah, I locked it. It's a good start. Yeah, it is a good this start. Was, this was just for discussion purposes. I think yep. we have so, a framework of an ordinance and some uh, homework assignments that we'll work on. Uh, and we'll try and circulate a draft of this before the next meeting. Yeah, okay. and I, if it's okay with you, I'd like to. Um, I still, I have a couple of um, friends on the force that with the Scarborough PD, if it's all right with you, I'd like to talk to them a little bit about Good. their comfort level and of things like this. Uh, like on patrol? Yeah, like when, if they were to get to go to a call for this, what's their comfort level and and uh, just advising this? Yes, should, should we not have the police, police chief offer that? I mean, I, I'm not opposed to it, but I don't yeah, no, want to go around him. Um, I mean, I'm just saying, I see them on a, Sure. I just didn't think it was a big deal to just say, ask questions yeah, when we have. And we'll have the chief here next week also. Right. Yeah. Month. yeah. We'll also speak to, uh, uh, and again, it's. Uh, hey, don't, don't take offense. I just no, I didn't. Make sure that no. we're following proper protocols. That yeah, you know, the, the other thing is, Kate's point earlier about there's some things that are is police work, highly professional, trained person, and other stuff that is. Yeah. It's lower on the on the totem pole. Yeah. When the call comes in, they pretty much have to deal with whatever they find when they right. arrive. So and that's discretion. So, yeah, you know? uh, which is why I, uh, having code enforcement go out there and say, you know, lower the light or shade the light. Yeah. Has a certain appeal to me. Yeah, but I also understand. But Tom three, they're not always. This mm. gentleman. They don't work nights. I also understand the urgency behind this yeah. ordinance, and this gentleman's been going through this for over a year now. And if that was me, I'd want to get this moving. And so I, I feel for you, and I, would, I just want to make sure we can do everything we can to get it moving as fast as we can. Because there uh, is a I process. Once it leaves ordinance, uh, it has to go to council. My, my guess is we ought, to yeah. be able, we ought to be able to get a draft going so that in April we could. So you'd like to pursue this piece independent of a larger approach, uh, including property maintenance? Because I think there's well, other conversations. I, I was... Uh, Larissa had me pretty well convinced that a, uh, uh, a derelict uh, property ordinance made sense, but I could see us trying to, if you guys agree that that's sort of a third prong on, on this for a good neighbor policy, oh, we, we, would, we would start to do a draft also to present in April. Yeah, I so mean, we I can catch up. That's what I want to know. That yeah. you want to continue with that larger so approach. Uh, so, it, I guess I'd, I'd be concerned just about the time frame. Uh, I mean, it's it's a lot of work. Yeah, no, no, no it's it's a, it's a lot of work, but, the, but a good neighbor problem could be. Uh, 
I guess I wouldn't want to slow down a lighting ordinance per se to do some of right. the other good neighbor stuff because I think that we we talked about it. I think we had an email thread going with a woman that had a neighbor that was yeah, um, another shooting, complaint. Him, yeah. shooting guns off it. Yeah. At, at Which was a noise issue. Yeah. And I think the sending the noise the, ordinance sending sufficient. Sergeant O'Malley out mm -hmm. made a difference because we have a noise ordinance yep. that says you can't unreasonably disrupt right. the neighborhood with noise. Right. Okay. So that that was that was resolved. That was resolved. Yep. Great. Um, so we'll try and catch up uh, uh, with the and the derelict duty as uh, property is obviously it's more along the lines of places that are in utter disrepair. Right. You know, we're not going to talk about uh, whether you like the way somebody landscapes or not, or whether they have a field uh, that has the grass growing up a foot because they want wildflowers. And, you know, there's a, a, we're not going to interfere on the broad discretion of people to maintain their property, but when it falls into utter disrepair, yeah. we've got to be able to have tools to... So, all right, so we'll work on that. So one thing I didn't see as part of this was um, uh, violation and penalties. Um, I assume that we've mapped up something. Yep. Um, yeah. Whatever, whatever the stick is. Excuse me, sorry. Yes, we'll make sure to include a provision yeah. like that. Okay. We'll so do that. We'll do that, too. Can I make a motion to table that? Yep. So um, I'd like to make a motion to table item number six, discussion on lighting and good neighbor ordinances. Second. Uh, and that will go to uh, its uh, being moved to the April meeting. Perfect. Good. All in favor? Yeah. Good. Thanks. So essentially all three items are coming back to you? Yep. Yep. So is your agenda complete for next time or do you want more? I would. <laughs> I think we're yeah. probably full up. Yeah. Good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I think that's plenty. It is plenty. And, um, and because we'll, we run. we'll work yeah. through these and we'll get them done uh, largely in April. Yeah. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Uh, so I'm moved. Second. Good. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Sorry, after Ron. Yeah. Good. Thanks, guys. Thank you. See you. Get to the time, 525.